study as the various lands of which we work today and pay my respects to elders both past, present and future. Thanks to everyone for joining us today for the next in our webinar series, the Monash Addiction Research Centre tries to bring together addiction researchers, clinicians and other experts from across the sector to really discuss emerging research and challenges in the addiction field. And it's our real privilege today to have our first international speaker and two amazing discussants to talk on a really important issue that I think you'll find incredibly exciting and pertinent. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from Associate Professor Kelly Dunn, uh, who's Associate Professor of the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit at John Hopkins University at School of Medicine. And I'm hoping, Kelly, to it's a good time for you in the evening and not too late. So thank you for coming on board. And then we'll be hearing two amazing uh, discussants, uh, Professor Rochelle Bookbinder and Associate Professor Susie Nielsen. Uh, just before we move on to the speakers of note, I just want to talk about, and, and to introduce those, I'd just like to talk about the, um, the next webinar we're having in a month's time. So just to put in everyone's mind and everyone's diaries, we've got to get another great stellar lineup of people for the next Mark's uh, webinar series, which is Vulnerable Children, Substance Use Among Young People and Caregivers in Child Protection Systems. And we've got the amazing Susan Badawi, Debbie Scott and Christine Grove, who come from a whole uh, different backgrounds, different perspectives, really giving us a really great understanding and flavor, and really, really addressing the issues around vulnerable children. So please put that in your diaries, Thursday the 16th of September, 2021 from two to three o'clock. So just moving to today's webinar, and I, I'm, I'm really keen to get onto the speakers because I know that's why you're here today. What I'll do is I'll introduce our three speakers, um, our main speaker, our two discussants. Uh, I'll then ask uh, Kelly to start and then for Rochelle and then Susie um, to follow up with their discussions. Uh, as you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a, a should be a QA and a um, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A component, not in the chat component. And our discussants will answer them either during the talk or we'll raise it as part of the discussion later uh, in the webinar. On that note then, let me introduce our three speakers. So Associate Professor Kelly Dunn, uh, as I say, is in the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit within the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Her primary research interest is in opiate use disorder. Associate Professor Dunn is the principal investigator on several grants supported by the National Institute on Drug Abuse to conduct human behavioral pharmacological studies that examine opioid and cannabinoid interactions in healthy and clinical treatment populations. She also looks at the genetic mechanisms underlying differences in opioid sensitivity and potential for addiction and clinically meaningful variations in opioid withdrawal phenotypes to inform medication development. Our first discussant is Professor Rochelle Bookbinder, who is an Australian NHMRC Senior Principal Research Fellow. Uh, Rochelle has been the Director of the Monash Department of Clinical Epidemiology since its inception in 2001, and is a professor in the Monash University Department of Epidemiology and Preventive Medicine since 2007. She is a world-renowned rheumatologist and clinical epidemiologist who combines clinical practice with research in a wide range of multidisciplinary projects related to arthritis and musculoskeletal conditions. And our final discussant is Associate Professor Susie Nielsen, who is Deputy Director of the Monash Addiction Research Centre and an NHMRC Career Development Fellow. Her research has led to a greater understanding of how to identify, respond to prescription and over-the-counter drug-related problems. She has informed legislative changes in Australia to reduce pharmaceutical drug harm, expanded overdose prevention with naloxone in primary care settings, and informed clinical guidelines on the use of opioid agonist treatment for prescribed opioid dependence. So I'm sure you're all eager to get going, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Kelly. So Kelly, please join us. We're all excited to hear what you have to say. Welcome. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to present these data. So I'll get this started. Are you able to see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Yes, it's wonderful, thank you. Um, so yes, thank you for the opportunity to talk about these data. Many of them are actually, um, pretty new. So this is a, an area of research that we just recently initiated. Well, we initiated probably about five years ago, but the studies are all just 
finishing now. And so I actually have some data that I just received um, earlier today that I'll be able to share with you. So very preliminary, but exciting for us. So the title of my talk, <clears throat> are can cannabinoids help us address the opioid crisis? So for the purpose of this talk, I thought I'd just give a brief background into why we think this, this is an important area of research and then address two areas of research that we're looking at um, kind of broadly in, our, in my laboratory, which is to look at whether cannabinoids can reduce opioid reliance in a safe and clinically meaningful way. And then also whether cannabinoids might have value at, for managing symptoms of opioid withdrawal. And then we'll talk, I'll talk about some of the next steps that we're working through. <clears throat> So as a background, there's a long history of meaningful opioid cannabinoid interactions in the literature. In fact, the earliest report that we could find of this was a case study published in 1889 that reported an individual who had been, who had, uh, was being withdrawn off of laudanum, the opioid laudanum, um, was found to respond positively when provided with cannabis. And the evidence of that <clears throat> was that they were able to uh, walk around on the veranda without the aid of a cane. <clears throat> excuse me, as you follow through the literature and you look, there's, you see that uh, there's been a robust area of preclinical or animal literature that's been studying these meaningful interactions for many years. And we, there's, there's a lot of research that was initiated in the 60s and it kind of continued on past that point. And for whatever reason, and, and we, have some re we have some speculations as to why, but it hasn't really made the jump into human research until this really in the past five or so years, the past decade. And uh, there's a catalyst for why we think that this has occurred. So in the United States, we're having, and internationally as well, but in the United States, we're having this opioid overdose epidemic that really started to uh, increase in severity in around 2012 and has um, continued on an upward escalating trend. And as a result, there's a lot of interest in finding ways to better manage pain in patients uh, and doing so in a way that reduces opioid related consequences. And so uh, that could be either prescribing lower doses of opioids, or it could be just reducing the overall exposure to opioids for shorter durations. And so uh, we refer to this as opioid sparing. And so there's a lot of interest in looking to see, are there mechanistically informed medications that we could layer with opioids that would allow us to administer uh, less of them? And then at the same, at the same time, we're seeing high rates of persons who are requiring treatment for opioid use disorder. And uh, opiate use disorder, we have medications that work well for that indication, but we also know that uh, those are opiate medications most often, methadone and buprenorphine. And there's a lot of interest in, in developing non-opioid medications for that indication. So uh, at the same time, in the, in the United States, we've had this kind of weird public experiment where um, medicinal cannabis, the, the use of cannabis for therapeutic purposes has proliferated. And it's done so outside of any sort of empirical or a scientific base and outside of any sort of uh, kind of federal regulation. So whereas in the, with uh, other pharmaceutical medications, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, would review safety data and efficacy data and make decisions, or with uh, medications or drugs that are um, firmly illicit and are only used for recreational purposes, and we have the Justice Department that governs those, but cannabis has kind of fallen into this gray area in between, and it's actually being approved at the state level through, uh, through constitutional votes. And so it's being approved kind of by the constituents of the states, and the federal government has, has kind of agreed not to step in and, and um, prevent that from happening. And so we're having this kind of increase in medicinal cannabis that's kind of popping up in different states over time, uh, and it's and it's supported in part by this kind of vocal advocacy from patients in the field who uh, are very emphatic that the use of cannabinoids is very um, useful for them in helping to taper themselves off of opioids or to reduce their reliance on opioids. And their advocacy is so strong that it's actually led to policymakers uh, listing opiate-related indications as um, qualifying reasons to gain access to medicinal cannabis. And so we're in this position where we're seeing this proliferation of medicinal cannabis um, for conditions like opiate use disorder or opioid uh, analgesic or opioid sparing indications, uh, but we really don't have a sufficient evidence base to support that yet. And so our research is trying to address, kind of fill in those gaps a little bit. So I'll just review briefly some of the existing literature that do support this. And so as I mentioned in the preclinical literature, the animal literature, 
we know as far back as the 60s that there was very you know, rigorous, elegant studies that were done that showed reliably that when you combine can, uh, cannabinoid products or cannabinoids with opioids, you can get an enhanced effect. And that can translate into things like uh, requiring a lower dose of opioid to achieve the same level of analgesia when it's combined with a cannabinoid versus not. You could take doses of opioids that are subtherapeutic and by layering them with a cannabinoid, you can make them efficacious. Uh, the result was also not specific to any one opioid. So you were, so the studies were able to show that the effect was true across multiple different compounds, which is useful from a medicinal standpoint because it suggests it wouldn't have to be layered with a specific opioid. It could just have kind of broad applicability. And perhaps the more, most importantly is that the effects didn't appear to extend to consequences of opioid exposure, specifically things like respiratory depression or changes in physiological parameters. And th this is somewhat... Uh, the caveat is that these were done in animals, and so we don't have you know, very good trans, uh, translatability to humans, but there's no strong signal for those consequences. On the other side, uh, the studies also show reliably that the co-administration of, of a cannabinoid with an opioid can reduce opioid self-administration, again, across multiple forms of opioids, and that it, uh, multiple cannabinoids are able to suppress the severity or the symptoms of opioid withdrawal, suggesting that there may be a signal for that indication as well. So, you know, as I mentioned, the, these studies were kind of done in, in chunks and they popped up and they had this robust area of research and then it went away and then it came back up again and kind of cycled in and out, but it never really made the jump into humans. And I think one of the reasons that is the case is that the cannabinoids that were studied in these, uh, in, in these animal studies are not things that are approved for use in human consumption. And in many cases, they're highly potent, very specific cannabinoids that would likely cause psychiatric side effects if they were administered to humans. And, and so a lot more work needs to be done to develop those in a way that would be safe, but that's probably been a big barrier to translating into human studies. And so it wasn't really, there was a catalyzing event, I think in the United States, a, a study that was published that really kind of propelled this field forward. And this was an epidemiological study that really led to a lot of the human work that's being done now. So this study was published in 2014. And what these researchers did was looked at states that came on board with access to medicinal cannabis. And so they kind of came on at different time points over this extended period of time from 1999 to 2010. And within those states, the researchers looked at the rate of opiate related overdose. And that what they found was this uh, strong correlation between the, and the approval of medicinal cannabis and the expansion of that in the state and a, an associated reduction in the rate of overdose that was occurring, opiate related overdose that was occurring. And this is most prominently displayed in this red box here. So you could see across the, across the years that we were seeing this upward trajectory in opiate related overdoses, which is what, you know, which is the trend that we recognize. But that in the final year in 2010, they started to see a decline in opiate related overdoses among states that had access to medicinal cannabis, this blue line here, uh, relative to states that did not have access that were continuing in this upward trajectory. So this was published and this made a, a really, this made a lot of news because this was published at a time where we were seeing a shift in the use of uh, prescription opiates over to heroin. And we were also seeing the infiltration, the beginning signs that our heroin product was being adulterated with fentanyl. Uh, and so this was this was huge because we were seeing this kind of increase in overdose and weren't really quite sure how to best address it. And again, we have this vocal patient advocacy group that's that's um, very emphatic that cannabinoids are very useful for uh, modifying opioid use. And so this led to a, a variety of different research and researchers were able to find multiple signals suggesting that this effect is is genuine. And that included evidence that overdose in persons who were maintained on methadone. Uh, decrease among persons uh, when they were using cannabis regularly relative to when they weren't, or persons who weren't. They saw that overdose rates in locations uh, that had more cannabis dispensaries were lower than in places with higher cannabis dispensaries. They found that in persons with chronic pain, if they were using um, large amounts of cannabis or regularly using cannabis, then they had uh, they were using fewer prescription opiates they saw a reduction or improvements in quality of life and they saw decreases in the rate of injection drug use. So lots of signals suggesting that this effect might be true, all correlations, but still important signals. But as time went on and we started to see more evidence of this, 
uh, we started to accumulate more data, I guess, suggesting that perhaps this is not as clean cut or as straightforward of a relationship as the original studies might have suggested. And in fact, there was a study that followed that took the same data uh, from the original epidemiological study that I showed you, that catalyst event, and extended it out over several additional years. And so this is these are those same data sets um, extended now from 2010 to 2017. And what they found is they replicated the effect that the original group had found that there was a kind of slight decrease in overdose rates between 2009 and 2010, but that effect did not uh, persist. And in fact, not only did it not uh, persist, but it reversed pretty dramatically. And so you could see that here with this dark line in the middle showing uh, this is the opiate overdose rate, the trends over time. And you could see that, that um, again, it reversed up and increased. Uh, and it eventually the, the researchers identified that the effect of overdose, or I'm sorry, that cannabis access was associated with a 28% increase in opiate related mortality. So, you know, these data just speak, I think, again, to the, some of the limitations that we're working with. So we have these policymakers that are authorizing opiate related conditions for, uh, at, for access to medicinal cannabis. And we have this robust preclinical literature that supports it. But we really have a, a, a dearth of human clinical data to, su to support this effect. And so we wanted to, we set out to, to evaluate this using human laboratory designs. So first I'll talk about question one, which are, can, or which is cannabino can cannabinoids reduce opioid reliance in a safe and clinically meaningful way? So we choose to do this by using human laboratory designs. So I'll just take a moment to explain this. These are behavioral pharmacological research designs. This is our human lab session. You can see the there's a chair for the patient, the chair for the staff, and now we have our COVID protections with the screen in between. We have a lab, an exam bed set up in case patients have strong drug effects and they need to lay down. We bring them in in this study for eight hour sessions uh, on an outpatient basis. So we transport them to and from the clinic. We schedule sessions a week apart and we do a variety of different tasks. So we assess, we collect outcomes that are related to uh, abuse potential metrics. And that's a framework that's established by the Food and Drug Administration for any substance that crosses the blood brain barrier. So we apply that here to see whether or not we see changes in abuse potential when we combine drugs together. And then in this study, we're also doing a variety of different laboratory-based pain testing tasks. And uh, we do both acute pain and chronic pain measures as part of this. We, we decided to, to do this um, first with healthy individuals, and we also extended it more recently to persons who have knee osteoarthritis. The rationale for starting with healthy individuals is that we wanted to kind of model as much as we could a, a clinical setting. So if you were to go to your dentist and you needed access to an opioid medication for, or some sort of analgesic, uh, and you had no tolerance to opioids, no prior exposure, no existing chronic pain condition that might cause different, you know, that might have led to different neuroadaptations or um, concurrent medications that you're taking, would we be able to give you a dose of an opioid with a cannabinoid and produce the same level of analgesia that you might receive with the opioid? And we, you know, we anchor this with uh, FDA approved medications as well, because we wanted to have direct clinical applicability. And so uh, let me just talk quickly about our pain testing battery. So we collect a variety of different measures. We have four measures of acute pain. That's thermal pain, pressure pain, mechanical temporal summation, and the cold presser. So the thermal pain in the upper left is just a device that delivers a small amount of pain. We strap it to your arm, delivers a small amount of um, heat, and it can do so in pulses. And it just kind of activates those nerves that would respond to a heat stimulus. For all of these measures, I should mention that the patient or the participant is in full control of how much pain they experience. So what our primary outcomes are is that we're looking for the point at which they first detect the sensation, and then the point at which that sensation is experienced by them as being painful, and then the point at which that pain is intolerable. And at that point, they, we stop the task. Uh, and we have upper limits set for all of these so that uh, we don't cause any sort of extended damage. So thermal pain is one task. The second is pressure pain. This is our algometer on the top right. You can see there's a little plunger at the end and you position that against a muscle 
and you push into the muscle just as a slight pressure. And we're just looking for the point again that they can detect it and then the point at which it becomes painful. And that's just registering a different type of pain pathway. The cold presser is probably the most common form of pain measurement. Uh, it shows a strong signal before some of the other measures do in, in most cases. This is a circulating water bath. It maintains a, an even temperature, cold water temperature, and the participant puts their hand in the water and then tells us again the point at which it's cold, or at which it's painful and the point at which they need to remove it. And then we have mechanical temporal summation. Um, I've circled the top of this here. It looks kind of like a pin at the top of this uh, plunger. And um, it doesn't break the skin. It's actually very, very light, but you tap on your skin and your nerve in one place, and then you tap 10 times in a row and create a chain. And what that does is sensitize the nerve. And so uh, you're able to induce different types of pain. So altogether, these acute measures have, are just very comprehensive in their assessment of various different pain pathways. But we also wanted to measure chronic pain because we know that cannabinoids often have a signal that that if they are effective for pain, they most often are effective for kind of chronic pain conditions, not acute pain conditions. So we did that by uh, administering capsaicin cream. So this capsaicin is a 10% concentrated cream. In reference, most over-the-counter capsaicin creams, which you can buy for muscle pain, are 0.1%. Uh, so this is an order of magnitude more concentrated. And so we, uh, you can put it on the skin and it creates a diffuse pain that resembles more of a chronic pain condition. Like if you were to have lower back pain where it's a diffuse kind of radiating pain. Um, we can also rekindle it throughout the day by exposing it to that heat element. And so we were able to get this kind of re repetitive diffuse pain throughout the day and look to see whether or not we have a signal on that as well. So these are our pain testing batteries. So moving on to our healthy individual study. So we enrolled 29 individuals into the study. Many of them were opioid naive. None of them had tolerance or past 30 day exposure to opioids, but in many cases they had never been exposed to an opioid. Um, they were enrolled into a five day outpatient study. This was a triple blinded study. And, and what we mean by that is that neither the staff nor the participants knew on any one day what, this, what the participants were receiving, but neither of them knew what class of medications we were examining. So we were very careful to reduce any sort of bias in these participants. Um, it was double blind, double dummy placebo control. Our two study medications were hydromorphone uh, as a prototypical opioid sold in the United States as Dilaudid, and then dronabinol, which is a synthetic form of THC, which is sold in the US as Marinol. And again, we use those two meds, medications, because we wanted to use things that were approved by the FDA so that it could resemble what might happen in a real world, you know, immediate real world setting. And our outcomes, again, were the potential for abuse and acute and chronic pain measures. And here's our uh, diagram below. So on the first session, all participants received a four milligram dose of hydromorphone and a placebo dose of dronabinol. And we did this because we found in, in various studies that about 15% of people will have a strong response to this dose of hydromorphone. And most often that's a vomiting response. Uh, there's never been any cause of concern or vital signs, but we, we certainly don't wanna put somebody who has a strong agonist response into a position where we might enhance that response further with the co-administration of dronabinol. So in, as long as those individuals were able to pass through that session, then they, were, they entered into a randomized phase where they completed all of these sessions in random order and they are a placebo placebo session and then three additional sessions where they received the four milligrams of hydromorphone and they received increasing doses of dronabinol added on top so 2.5 5 and 10 milligrams of dronabinol so i'll show you some of the effects here so let me orient you to the graph on the left hand side you see self-report ratings these are our abuse potential ratings and they just monitor, we ask participants on a zero to 100 scale, are you feeling any drug effects? Do you feel any good effects? And do you feel any bad effects? The drug effects are represented in the circles and the good effects in the triangles, bad effects in the squares. And then across the bottom, you have the placebo, placebo, hydromorphone, placebo, and then hydromorphone with the increasing doses of dronabinol. And what you see is that the drug effects increase significantly from placebo to the hydromorphone condition. Oops. 
and uh, continue past that point. But we didn't see a huge escalation, a huge difference between uh, the dronabinol conditions and the hydromorphone condition. What we did know, and we saw this anecdotally as well, is that participants had um, more positive effects when they had lower doses of dronabinol and that as the, the dose of dronabinol increased, their uh, experience of the session decreased. So they had fewer good effects and they had an onset of bad effects. And we saw that same effect, we saw that same pattern when we looked at the number of adverse events that people were experiencing, such that with the higher doses of five and the 10 milligram dose of dronabinol added to four milligrams of hydromorphone, we saw an increase in the rate of adverse events. When we looked at our variety of pain outcomes, so again, we had those four acute pain measures a measure of chronic pain. And then we had three global measures where we averaged these together. We had a variety, we combined these together and did uh, looked at um, endogenous opiate response, a whole, a whole variety of measures. We, we only saw an effect on two things. So we saw that heat pain, both threshold and tolerance to so the point at which they identified pain and the point at which they needed the test to stop. Uh, we saw a positive interaction with hydromorphone and dronabinol 2.5. And then we saw one of our global measures of central sensitization that that same dose seemed to have a positive effect that participants could withstand those sessions or those tests for a longer period of time when they had that specific dose, but not when they had the higher dronabinol doses. So that doesn't suggest that's, that's kind of counter to what we might think. We, if you would think that if you administer dronabinol, and the low dose had a signal that you might then see an increased benefit with the higher doses, but that wasn't the case. And we saw no effect on any other pain measure that we studied. So we know, so this didn't line up well with what we know from the field, right? Because we know that all of these patients are telling us unequivocally that by con combining cannabinoids with their opioid medication, they're able to taper their opioids more effectively. And so we wanted to dig into this a little bit further and try to understand why there was such a discrepancy there. And we know from the opiate field that there are uh, profound individual differences in how people experience opioids, with some individuals not detecting or being able to differentiate an opioid from placebo really at all until the dose becomes very high. And then other persons, you know, as I mentioned, having this a four milligram dose of hydromorphone or even lower and having strong agonist effects in response to it. And so we in the field refer to that as being an opioid responder or non-responder or a measure of opioid sensitivity. So we went back and dichotomized the group and said on the day that they received hydromorphone, uh, if, were they able to discriminate it from their baseline doses? And um, if we dichotomize them there, do we see a different signal here? Is it, you know, could this effect be related to opioid sensitivity? Um, and it seems that we may, that that may be the case. And so these data show you the same drug effect scale that I showed you earlier. On the left-hand side, this is averaged across the group. Again, placebo, placebo, hydromorphone, placebo, and then the addition of dronabinol, where we didn't really see much of an enhancement. But when we split the, the group into opiate responder and non-responder, that's where we start to see some meaningful relationships. So in the opiate responder group, you can see that their experience of hydromorphone and placebo is, is much different than the non-responder group. And the addition of dronabinol did very little. But in the opiate non-responder group, the dronabinol actually did seem to have an inverted effect there. So they were having some, somewhat of an, a dronabinol effect um, in that condition. And the same is true when you look at other measures. So this is an example where we asked patients how high they felt. Again, they rate it on a scale of zero to 100. On the left-hand side, you can see that overall with the group collapse, you don't see much of a signal. You see a slight enhancement when the dronabinol is added, but not anything too strong. And then on the right hand side, you can see that when you add, when you uh, dichotomize this into responders and non responders, that the opiate responders had a slight enhancement, and then the non responders had went from the hydromorphone only condition where they had almost no high to having a dose dependent increase in the feelings of high with the addition of dronabinol. And then this effect also extended to a pain to pain measures as well. So this is just general sensitivity. It's an average rating across four of our uh, acute and chronic pain outcomes. And again, in this case, the sensitivity when it goes down suggests that there's um, more pain or more analgesia. And so you can see that sensitivity was actually highest with the hydromorphone condition and then came down with the dronabinol conditions. But then when you look at it as a function of responder, non-responder, that's where you see the differentiation. 
So this study was not prospectively designed to look at opiate responders and non-responders. Um, and you can see that the sample isn't well balanced. So it was 20, not, 20 responders to eight non-responders, but it is the first study in this, in this field to look at this effect and to look at it as a function of opiate responder status. So we think that there's value in pursuing this a little further. So I just wanna quickly show you some of the, the data that I, I mentioned were just um, provided to me this morning <clears throat> and where we, we replicated mo uh, many of these methods in a population of individuals who have knee osteoarthritis. So we wanted to replicate these sessions in a population that had existing chronic pain because there are neuroadaptations that occur. And because this group is, is unlikely to be, they, they're not opioid tolerant, but they're certainly opioid experienced and they have a lot of other medications on board as well. And so it, you know, it could be that we don't see a signal in an acute healthy individual population, but in persons that have existing chronic pain, perhaps they would be more sensitive. So we enrolled 37 individuals into a four-day outpatient study. Again, triple blind, a double blind, double dummy. We use the same medications, hydromorphone and dronabinol, the same outcome measures, the same pain testing measures. In this case, we only again had four sessions. Our first session was a hydromorphone only day. Uh, as long as they uh, didn't show strong agonist effects of that, they proceeded into the randomized portion where they had a placebo day, a dronabinol only day and a hydromorphone plus dronabinol day. So this study is a little different in that we didn't have the increasing doses of dronabinol, but it does add insight because we do have a dronabinol only condition where in the last study, we didn't have that opportunity. And so <clears throat> let's look at the same results across in, in this population. So on the left-hand side, you see the self-report, again, the drug effects, the good effects and the bad effects. You can see that um, the drug effect scale, we'll take a look at that, the circles here. You see that it increased somewhat with the hydromorphone only dose, but that it was really the addition of dronabinol, both with placebo and then combined with, with hydromorphone that really increased the ratings of drug effects. And that we didn't see the same relationship with the increase. Well, we do see here actually that with the bad effects, they increased during the two dronabinol conditions as well but the good effects didn't take the same steep decline that we had uh, observed in the other study. I will also know just, um, just to recall that the dose of dronabinol that we're using in this study is the highest dose that we used in the prior study. Uh, so this study also recorded a much lower rate of adverse events. So the highest adverse events were actually in the, in the hydromorphone only condition. The addition of dronabinol uh, didn't increase the rate of adverse events in this group. And so, uh, you know, there's various reasons why that might be the case. <clears throat> we also looked at this as a function of opioid responder and non-responder. So we looked at the highest, again, on the left-hand side, these are the drug effects. Uh, and then when you split it by opioid responder and non-responder, you see again, this differentiation. This sample actually, again, although it was not prospectively designed to look at responder status, it had an almost even split in the number of people that could detect the opioid and could not. And I think that that's you know, interesting for several reasons, including that these are people that have existing uh, an existing chronic pain condition, many of whom have been treated chronically with opioids for this condition. Uh, but nevertheless, we see that the opioid responders seem to have a stronger overall effect, both with the hydromorphone as well as the dronabinol condition relative to the opioid non-responders. And then when we look at the ratings of high, we, saw, we see a similar trend where hydromorphone on average does not produce much of a high, but the dronabinol conditions really did produce a much stronger high experience that wasn't, didn't appear to be enhanced with the hydromorphone and dronabinol combined condition. And that when you look at the effect as a function of responder and non-responder, you again see this significant enhancement of high with the addition, oops, with the addition of dronabinol, um, regardless of whether or not it was co-administered with hydromorphone. And then finally, uh, this is the same pain outcome that I showed you for the prior study. And we see here again, uh, that the opiate responder, non-responder, that they, that they differentiate but in this case, they don't really have, it doesn't appear to be all that meaningful. And I will say that the, that the scale here is very, um, is very narrow. There was really very little effect of any of these medications on general sensitivity. Whereas in the prior study, we had that kind of huge decline uh, as a function of the increasing doses of, of dronabinol. And so that 
uh, you know, again, it could be, um, we're, I'll say that we're digging into this to learn a little bit more. And these data are, you're actually the first people to see this. So they're hot off the press. Um, but I suspect that it has something to do with the differences in the population and the existence of the chronic pain and the opiate tolerance, or I should say exposure. So to summarize uh, for this question in healthy individuals, there seems to be a very narrow therapeutic window for the use of dronabinol when combined with hydromorphone. Only the 2.5 milligram dose showed a signal. There's now been three human laboratory studies uh, that have shown the same dose, 2.5 milligrams, when combined with an opioid seems to have a positive effect, but no other dose. Um, and the five and 10 milligram doses increase both the radians of dysphoria, bad effects, and then the rate of AEs, as well as the abuse risk. So that seems risky because you could take a two milligram, 2.5 milligram dose and double it. And now, now all of a sudden you've entered into a risky area. And it does suggest that our data did suggest that opioid sensitivity may influence the experience. And the knee osteoarthritis, the results are very preliminary. Um, and dronabinol appeared to, to be really driving the results. So the additional analyses forthcoming for this would be to look at whether or not we can identify someone as a dronabinol responder, because no one's done that before. And, and I actually, you know, I'm not certain what that would look like and how that might influence the results. And then we tried to balance these samples um, equally and across men and women. So we wanna look at these as a function of sex as well. So just quickly, I'll, I'll mention whether or not, our second question, can cannabinoids reduce symptoms of opioid withdrawal? So we've done less work in this area, but we're building it out. If you're unfamiliar with opioid withdrawal, this is what the general curve looks like. So uh, depending on whether we'll use short acting opiates as our metric here, um, the acute withdrawal syndrome will start, will start to emerge maybe four to six hours after the last dose. It will peak around two to three days and it will uh, be, it'll remit generally around five to seven days. The experience of withdrawal usually starts with muscle pain, joint aches, nausea, diarrhea, can, uh, continue on to vomiting, hot and cold flashes, goosebumps, pupil dilation. And then uh, there's a development of craving, insomnia, severe insomnia, and mood disruption, most notably anxiety. And that continues for a four week period after the, uh, after the acute withdrawal period remits that's referred to as protracted withdrawal. So there's, there was one study that's looked at in humans, whether or not dronabinol was an effective way of managing opiate withdrawal symptom severity. And that study found that when compared to oxycodone, dronabinol wasn't as effective, but it did show some sort of a signal. So there was some slight withdrawal suppression, uh, but the dose that was used was relatively high. It was 30 milligrams. And if they push the dose any higher than that, then they, uh, then they produce clinically significant levels of tachycardia. Um, so it seemed to be probably not a good path forward to study uh, dronabinol for that indication. However, in the field, as we know, patients tell us that this is effective. And so, but there wasn't very much data to inform that. So we ran a survey study and 200 individuals who told us that they were co-using both opioids and cannabinoids and uh, asked them, do you ever use cannabis to manage symptoms of your opiate withdrawal? 63% told us that they did. And then we asked them, you know, on these various withdrawal symptoms, uh, did the cannabis improve or worsen the symptom experience? And overwhelmingly, they rated it as improving it. And then the four symptoms that they said that 50% of respondents or more indicated uh, were helped, was helped by uh, the co-administration of cannabis was anxiety, tremor, insomnia, and restlessness. And so particularly the anxiety and insomnia, I think is, uh, is what we might expect. It's what um, people often tell us that they're using cannabis for. And then we also asked participants, uh, we gave them two different opiate withdrawal scales. One is the, the subjective opiate withdrawal scale, which is a number of different um, symptoms on which they rate each of the symptoms on a four point Likert scale. And then the other is just a single item visual analog scale. How much withdrawal did you experience on a scale of zero to 100? We said, think back to the last day that you had opioid withdrawal with and without cannabis, and please rate the severity of your symptoms on both of these scales. And what you can see is that participants overwhelmingly said that their symptoms were better managed or were less severe on days that they used cannabis than on days that they didn't use cannabis. And this was also correlated with other uh, elements that we might expect, suggest, uh, such as uh, days used in the past 30, which we know is correlated with the severity of the withdrawal syndrome, and the effect was stronger in women than was in men. So there's some kind of ecological validity there, um, even though this is kind of a retros retrospective assessment. So my colleague, Dr. Bergeria, 
has uh, recently launched uh, within patient study to examine this in a more rigorous way uh, to add anything to this literature. There's really not much there. So this is a within subject design. Each participant completes two identical sessions, one that's active and one that's with placebo. There are three day long sessions and they're persons who are maintained on methadone for the treatment of opiate use disorder. They're admitted into a residential research unit where they live with us for three days. On the first day, they receive 50% of their clinically prescribed dose of methadone. And then they slowly withdraw off of that for the rest of the period. And they receive four, four drug administrations over the course of the study. Uh, depending on the session, it's either placebo or it's epidiolex or cannabidiol, FDA approved formulation. Uh, and then at the end, they have the opportunity to work to earn their methadone dose back. And so th that's a measure of how, how effective is cannabidiol at suppressing symptoms of opiate withdrawal. And then at the end, before they discharge, everyone receives their methadone dose to totally um, eliminate the withdrawal syndrome. So this is measuring spontaneous withdrawal from opioids and whether or not a cannabinoid can suppress the, these symptoms of withdrawal. In these data, there's two participants that have enrolled in the study so far. So this is very preliminary, but what this graph shows you is the onset of withdrawal in the placebo conditions, which is red, and then the cannabidiol condition, which is blue. And again, this is within subjects, so each participant completed each condition. And you can see two, two notable things. One, that withdrawal does increase over this period of time, um, suggesting that this model is a good way of assessing this. And then two, that the cannabidiol condition has lower withdrawal severity. So this is something, these data, again, are very preliminary. But uh, it, you know we're continuing to enroll participants into the study, but it does it does provide us a signal, and it's the first uh, that we've had in the field to suggest that empirically that this might really have um, some value in the treatment of opiate withdrawal symptoms. So, can opioids help us address the? Can cannabinoids help us address the opioid crisis? When we look at the reduction or the reducing opiate reliance, dronabinol does not appear to be a useful complement. It has a mild effect on pain, a narrow therapeutic window, a moderate potential for abuse, and a high adverse event rate in persons who are non-tolerant. Opioid sensitivity also seems to differentially impact its effect. And certainly when we look at in persons who have um, existing chronic pain, the dronabinol actually seems to be driving a lot of the euphoria and the effects that we saw there. Uh, and, and the converse is, does it treat symptoms of opioid use disorder? So we know that those are individuals who are sensitive to opioids. And so if that, to the degree that that plays a role, that might have a positive benefit here. And we do see some signs, uh, very preliminary, that uh, cannabinoids, particularly cannabidiol, may reduce some of the symptoms of opiate withdrawal severity. So next steps, we are currently in the process of replicating our two laboratory studies in the healthy individuals and the persons with knee osteoarthritis we're modifying, we're changing both the cannabinoid and the opioid dosing in those samples so we can expand the examination a little further. We're continuing to enroll into our residential examination of CBD. And we're also working to look at some ecological momentary assessment of pain, and cannabis and opiate use. So in people who are telling us that they're using these, that have chronic pain and that they're co-using these drugs, these medications, we're asking them uh, multiple times throughout the day to tell us exactly how they feel so that it's not really a retrospective um, report of how they feel, but we can get in real time whether or not they're experiencing more pain and we can look at the trends over time. And so I'll end here. I'll just uh, say that our research is supported generously by NIDA and that this work uh, is the result of multiple different um, staff members' contributions. So thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kelly. I'm now just going to talk for a very short time because I'd like for us to have some time for discussion, but just really to cover for three minutes um, a couple of points that I'm thinking. I hope that you can see my slides on the screen. Um, so again, I think one of the key points around the evidence that came out very early in Dr. Dunn's talk was this issue around how do we interpret the ecological evidence? And I think it's really interesting that this point around this changing understanding of what the ecological evidence is showing. Originally, we thought um, there was an association that was positive. Now we see that that association may be negative. Actually, what the authors who did this analysis concluded is that it's probably unlikely that there's any association between the small number of people who use medical cannabis and the large conflicting effects on opioid mortality. So essentially, 
that this is a, you know, a spurious finding. And I guess I just wanted to highlight that we see lots of spurious findings and not to make things too light, but you know, associations between ice cream sales and shark attacks, you know, this isn't necessarily driven that, that one causes the other, but there are similar conditions that might support both. Um, and then we see completely spurious um, findings, for example, you know, falling televisions and university enrolments. It is not uncommon to find correlations between things that are not caused by each other. The other thing I just wanted to highlight, and I'm just so glad that Dr. Dunn was able to present this really exciting new research today, is that the evidence in this area is changing so rapidly. Um, and we're also updating a, a, a systematic review that we did that was published almost five years ago now, um, four years ago now. Um, and in that, we found um, a number of studies that, that provided a lot of preclinical evidence, but no clinical evidence really. Um, there was only one study that provided any sort of support for an opioid sparing effect and eight that didn't when we looked at clinical research. When we're updating this review, we now have an additional 25 preclinical studies and an additional 25 clinical studies, including a number of randomized controlled trials. It just, I guess, supports the strength of the evidence in this area is changing and that we do urgently need science um, to be able to answer this question, given the conflicting evidence otherwise. Uh, I guess the other thing that I wanted to mention, and I think um, that we'll see from um, Dr. Bookbinder kind of a, a better discussion on this, but there is real tensions between lived experience and the state of the evidence. And we see position statements from groups like IAST really highlighting that um, they're not dismissing the lived experience, but currently, um, given the evidence, they're not endorsing kind of regular clinical use of cannabinoids. Um, outside the context of uh, clinical trials. And those same kind of statements have been made by um, groups like ANSCA, for example, um, again, saying that, you know, that outside clinical trials, it's probably a little premature to be using um, cannabinoids for pain. And this really creates a lot of tension for patients who are hearing that these are really effective um, but, you know, but doctors are being sort of suggested that, that the evidence isn't there. And I think just to really highlight that that um, puts, you know, both patients and prescribers, I think, in a little bit of a challenging position. Um, so I might just sort of leave that there, hand over to um, Dr. Bookbinder for her comments, and then maybe we'll have some time for questions and discussion after that. So uh, thank you, uh, Suzanne, and, and thanks, Kelly, for a really great talk. Um, so my, my take on this from as a clinician uh, is, is, that it, is that I think the evidence is pretty clear that, it, that it, maybe it doesn't provide much pain relief and maybe it's its place, if there is a place, might be in, in, reduce, in helping people to get off opioids by reducing the symptoms of withdrawal. Um, from my perspective as a rheumatologist and clinician who sees lots of people with pain, um, I, I guess my concern is whether uh, there'll be a can, cannabinoid epidemic following the opioid epidemic and we haven't really achieved much um, overall. Um, I wanted to mention that we do have, we have done a systematic review on uh, the use of cannabinoids for all types of pain, both cancer pain and non-cancer pain, that's been published in the BMJ shortly, and it's accompanying a, a rapid recommendation, a bit one of those BMJ rapid recommendations. And what we found overall was that that if you look at the continuous measure of pain, um, there, there's a very small benefit unlikely to be of any importance overall. There might be a very small percent of people, 10% or less, that might get a small improvement in pain. Uh, and, and there are lots of uh, adverse effects, um, but they weren't very serious adverse effects, but, but there were, you know, that they, tolerability was an issue for a, for a large proportion of people overall across all the trials. Uh, when we looked at cancer and non-cancer separately, um, the results were the same, um, with probably even less of an effect um, overall for cancer pain versus non-cancer pain, which was the opposite of what uh, some people 
thought maybe we'd find beforehand. Um, and the, the guideline that we made, uh, I think, was very much influenced by three consumers and confirms what Kelly's saying, that, that people who take cannabis think that, it's, that it works. And, and so based on the evidence, we, we had a guideline panel and the consumers basically convinced some of us who weren't, who thought that the recommendation should be uh, against use of cannabis, um, they convinced us that even a small benefit for a very small number of people means that it might still be worth a trial. And I'm wondering now whether those very small benefit benefits might be related to the, whether they're responders or not to opioids. Um, and I hadn't thought about that before. Um, but my take on this is probably still the same as, as the recommendations in Australia, that, that anyone who wants to take it should be within a properly um, constituted clinical trial. Because um, I think overall there is, there is um, low certainty evidence in that the trials a lot of them couldn't properly blind people. And even then they couldn't find a very big effect. So even if you could blind people, the chances of finding a, a therapeutic benefit would be even smaller. Um, I just wanted to make uh, an I and just had a question for Kelly. So, uh, and this reflects my, I just want to say this reflects my clinical practice. So patients who want it, go online and get the cannabis and then come back and say, actually, you were right, it didn't really make any difference. Uh, so I think the best approach is not to, to start the opioids in the first place, because I don't think they work very well for chronic pain in any case. Uh, and I just had the final, Kelly, the question for Kelly is, when people said that, that you showed that they felt a high, I'm wondering whether the high means that, that when, when you're high, you're not worried about the pain so much. And so that might be a better reflection of the effect of opioids in the real world compared to those specific pain measures. So that was just a, a, a query from a clinician with no, no uh, expertise in this field at all. Yeah, so that's a great question. It's something that we've thought a lot about too, because especially with the healthy individual sample, these are all persons who had no history of drug use. And so we didn't really know if they knew what a high was, right? They don't really have a good reference for that. And so um, I, I will say that with our adverse events, one of the most common adverse events was uh, ratings of euphoria that the participant experienced as ne <clears throat> negative. They, were, they felt over euphoric, I guess. And so I, I think we probably, I don't know the exact answer to your question, but I think that that's insightful and we should probably look into that a little bit more just to see exactly what the self, the subjective experience was and, and was it really high versus just kind of that different or the, I guess the detachment from the experience of pain that we often hear reported with opioids. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rochelle, for segueing from your discussion to a question to Kelly. I thought that was seamless. Um, I just wanted to pose a question just in terms of our understanding of these data. I think we are starting to have this question of what are we actually treating here? And I think we often have the same question with opioids. Are we treating opioid withdrawal or are we treating pain? And, and I was just wondering if you could speak to that, Kelly, in terms of, of the cannabinoids. Is that the sense that you're getting that we're, that we're possibly kind of mainly treating opioid withdrawal here? Yeah, so going into this, we thought that there was a genuine, that there would be a genuine effect on pain, that we would see that enhancement with analgesia. Um, but the evidence really doesn't suggest, you know, accumulating evidence from our lab as well as others just continually suggests that that effect isn't there. But, and the fact that patients in the field are suggesting that this is useful for opioid sparing indications. I agree that I think that perhaps the mechanism through which that's working is, is treating their symptoms of acute opiate withdrawal. So it's not really helping them manage their pain, but it is helping them to manage their experience of withdrawal so that they could successfully reduce their dose of opioid. So yeah, I think that that, uh, that was something I know that you've raised before that I think is, is, is really insightful that I think uh, I'm guessing that that's probably the direction of the effects. Yeah. 
And if I could just follow up with a question that came through in our chat box, which I think has been partially answered, but just to, to sort of clarify it a little bit more, um, just to talk a little bit more about these comparisons of opioid responders and non-responders, and also where you think that um, line of research might go. Yeah, so this is an area that we're very interested in. So we know from the from the opiate field that the experience, the difference in experience of opioids is so uh, profound that when a study, when a medication, when an opioid related medication is being examined, the FDA uh, formally recommends that patients are screened for their ability to differentiate the opioid from placebo. So they generally you do a qualifying session, determine that the individuals can differentiate, and then you will only allow those individuals that are sensitive into the trial. We chose not to do that because we wanted to model clinical practice and ended up with this kind of disparate group where we had some persons who were able to differentiate and others who, who aren't. And you know, as I mentioned, we're the this is the first study in this area of research that's that's done that, that's made that separation and looked at it. Um, but I, I think in general, that's a very understudied area of research that probably has, I think, a lot to do with, you know, there's a lot of individual differences in how people experience opioids. And I think that if we're looking to reduce the reliance on opioids in general or opiate related consequences, and we know that we have this different in sensitivity, that it makes it would make sense for us to follow that line of research a little further and see, you know, could we perhaps customize medications or do a more precision medicine approach based on someone's initial response to an opioid? Because if we know that a person is less sensitive to an opioid, uh, perhaps we don't start them on, on a medication. What we don't know is how that corresponds to the ultimate exposure. So if they uh, if they end up getting higher doses or if they're exposed to opioids for longer because the clinician is trying to work with them to reach a dose that is analgesic, uh, and and how what the consequences might be. So it's very understudied. There's there's very little empirical research on it, although it's it's such a well known condition that it, you know the formal guidelines actually kind of work around it. Great, thank you. Um, and maybe a bit of a question for uh, both uh, Dr. Bookbinder and uh, Dr. Dunn. Just to, I guess, I feel like sometimes we're chasing our tail a little bit here. And I just wonder your perceptions on whether or not we'd be pursuing cannabinoids so strongly for pain if we didn't already have an opioid crisis. Uh, Rochelle, do you have a, a thought about that? Yeah, I was thinking about that. I mean, I don't prescribe opioids hardly ever. Uh, and certainly not for chronic conditions. And we've done surveys of, um, we've got I mean, we've got a national database of people with rheumatoid uh, and about 30 to 40% of them are on opioids, even though their diseases are controlled. And when we look into it further, it's not the rheumatologists that prescribe it, it's the GPs. And I so I think the first thing is, should we, uh, I, I was thinking about chasing our tail now and we, we're finding, we're looking for other drugs to treat the side effects of the first drug that we that we actually know doesn't really work very well. And I think more effort should be made towards not starting those, those uh, drugs in the first place. And certainly in my area, um, the guidelines have really changed and, and, you know, they've gone from, you know, if you need to use it, use it for as short as possible time to really discouraging its use in the first place uh, because it actually doesn't work very well. And, and now I'm wondering whether it's got something to do with the opioid responders and non-responders and whether that's got anything to do with people who uh, have, you know, have low thresholds for pain maybe. Uh, and I saw a comment here about dopamine receptors and I don't know whether that's all genetically determined and people that go on chronic op opioids you know, they might have certain personalities. I mean, I'm just talking off the top of my head with no expertise, but I'm interested in your thoughts about that. Yeah, we have uh, time for a quick comment from Kelly and then we, we're going to be out of time, but it's been such a, such a great discussion. Uh, yeah, I'll just say that I think that uh, the reason I, I think that you're right that uh, it had if we were not in the position of this opioid crisis, perhaps we wouldn't be pursuing cannabinoids so aggressively. I also think that we in the United States have been forced into it because public policy has is expanding their use medicinally, and we just need to the science just needs to catch up. Great, thank you so much. Um, so if I can just thank um, our speakers, I'm so grateful to uh, Dr. Dunn for joining us in the evening from the United States and also for Dr. Bookbinder for, for coming along and sharing her thoughts.
Um, and to all of our participants, thank you so much for coming along. Um, and just also to um, remind you that we do have our next webinar coming up in September and to feel free to uh, register for that as well. We would love to see uh, many of you there as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for coming along today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. <laughs>